Like, do you say future with her? I don't... What was the question? I just... I, I don't know. Like, do I see her in the future as in, like, tomorrow? Or do you mean... Like, I don't actually... Or... Like, bro like how does he executive assist? You know? No, that's what I'm saying. Hey guys, welcome to the video. Thank you so much for clicking. I just want to let you know that the first five minutes of this video are actually an introduction to maths as a whole for people who haven't seen it before. Just so that way, whether you're watching at home or not, everyone can get something out of it. If you want to skip my humorous introduction into what maths is, you're welcome to. I'll put the timestamp here. However, I do encourage you to watch it because it's a nice trip down memory lane. and I think there are a few good jokes. Anyways, with all that said, here's the video. So Australia's greatest achievement, Married at First Sight, is back for season 11. For those of you who don't know, I'm going to quickly give you a rundown of what the show is. Basically, a bunch of strangers apply to be on a show where they get paired up with a complete stranger. Not only do they get paired up with a complete stranger, but they have to have a whole wedding ceremony and they basically live as a married couple for eight weeks. And each week they basically decide whether they want to stay in the experiment or leave the experiment. And by staying in the experiment, they mean stay in this forced relationship. Or by leave the experiment, they mean leave this forced relationship. And basically this whole season of television leads to a grand finale where they decide whether they want to continue this relationship outside of the TV show, or they take the other option, which is far more likely, which is they decide they never want to speak to this person again, and they sign up for years of therapy for what they've been through. So I have to say goodbye. Do you want a tissue? No. Basically, this show appeals to that part in ourselves that would rather watch other people fall apart than work on ourselves. Am I just supposed to wake up every day, have sex with you and say, no, hey, no. How, how good is this day? Sex, sex, sex. You Listen, have a problem you, you with intimacy, nothing. Josh. Why would the unhappy couples of Australia work on their marital struggles when they can just watch people on TV yell at each other for 90 minutes? You can have sex, Josh, but you don't know stream. how to love. And I don't know how to crack it. And that's sort of the appeal of the show. Everyone knows that you're here to watch these people argue and fight and cheat and tear each other apart because when this show has scandals, boy does it have scandals. It is just completely captivating. It's become very apparent as this show has gone on that it's really not that interested in pairing people that want to find love together. And instead it seems hellbent on pairing two people that are totally incompatible with one another and seeing who's the first to take out their childhood trauma on the other. This show basically feels like it's designed to be a pressure cooker of relationship drama. Australia as a society has fully got on board with this idea. You know, I remember a few years ago, my friend who worked at the Australian equivalent of a warm-up basically told me that after a substantial episode of Maths, people were coming in and asking him, did you see what happened on Maths last night as if it was an international tragedy? So to say this show has a massive cultural impact is almost an understatement. These videos are here for two reasons. One, if you're enjoying the show and watching the show currently, I want this to serve as a fun little recap. And two, if you don't have time to watch the show, but you want to be caught up on all the drama and you want to pretend that you know what's going on, you can come to my videos. That way you can enjoy the show without actually having to admit to anyone that you watch 42 hours of this series. The only other thing you have to know is that this show has a panel of experts and basically the best way to describe them is imagine the judges on Australian Idol or X Factor, but instead of judging people for how well they sing or their weird talents, they are judging these people for who they are at their very core. I don't really even have an answer for you. Just own it and answer the question. What's your motivation to saying those things that are insulting? Or are you trying to hurt her? Explain yourself. I said them just to hurt her. The experts currently are John, Alessandra, and Mel. To catch you up on who these people are, basically John is like the main expert. He's the ringleader. He's kind of the final say on this show and all the relationships. He's the big man, right? Then after that, we've got Mel. Now Mel's had a few controversies where she's seemingly missed the mark and Australia doesn't agree with her decisions. The big one being where she told someone off for calling their abusive partner the C word. Like what Bronson says to me, like I really don't care. Ennis was amazing that night, like really amazing. I loved her pieces that night. Next morning, the Hulk come out straight back to A tip from me to you, don't use language like that if you want any chance of a relationship with a woman. A very Australian drama to have, that's for sure. And then we have Alessandra. Now, Alessandra was brought in in the past like three or four seasons and she's the sexologist, I believe. And basically she is similar to the other two, but she has a primary focus on sex. I am very interested to know um, where you stand in terms of your sexual pleasure. And she was actually here to replace Trisha, who was an older judge who actually left because she realized that the show was starting to prioritize hiring people that were there for drama and social dysfunction rather than there to actually find love. And she sniffed that out and she left. And the show's way of addressing these very valid concerns was to basically fire her. It was a very weird response, but I wouldn't change it at all because now we get Intimacy Week. And Intimacy Week is one of the best weeks of reality television you will ever see. You have a problem with intimacy. 
intimacy, Josh, and I'm too much for you, and you don't know what to do. And I'm going to speak my truth for every goddamn woman in the world. Oh, hallelujah! Three minutes. You're looking at me or through me? No, you're not doing it properly. You're not taking it seriously. Taking it seriously. What was going through my head? We do the eye gazing. Um, how long do we have left? I made the commitment to stay here another week and work on this relationship, and I'm going to do that with or without Bronte. You comfy? Did you feel a bit awkward being on this date on your own? I'm not on my own. I have my wife with me. People come from all over Sydney to chill here. Basically, you just watch two people that don't even know each other's last names try and understand each other's kinks, and it is hysterical. It bothers you that I like intimacy more than you. It bothers you. You can't keep up. Does it demand you? But that's all to come because right now we're in week one and that is the weddings. That's right, these complete strangers that don't know each other get full on all out weddings. And it's as weird as you would expect. So the first couple we're introduced to in season 11 is Cassandra and Tristan. And I know I talked a whole lot of smack about this show is all about drama and it doesn't really care about pairing two compatible people together. But unfortunately, this first couple is totally compatible. This is like one of the few times the show gets it right completely. So unfortunately, I don't have too much to get into here. Cassandra is an absolute sweetie that just has an absolutely heartbreaking backstory. Basically, she had a childhood sweetheart of seven to eight years who passed away in a motorbike accident. We were together for probably like eight years, eight years. And then one day, yeah, he was gone. Um, ride a bike accident. And she's been paired with someone called Tristan who genuinely looks like if he got stabbed, he would apologize to the person that stabbed him. My name is Tristan and I'm from Sydney, New South Wales. And your age. And I'm 30. <laughs> yeah. So just two complete sweethearts. Things to note is her dad is just the most gorgeous person I think I've ever seen. Like what a warm, warm soul. I'm here to make you yummy food, not healthy food. <laughs> eat, 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 eat. eat. <laughs> Food. This is the show firing on all cylinders. So far, it actually feels like they got it right. I literally can't picture either of these two having a massive fight. So for all the smack I just talked, good job maths. But the next ones we have are Sarah and Tim. And I'm just going to say it. I think these two are going to spend the whole experiment fighting. There's just so much awesome cringe between these two already. Sarah comes on and basically makes herself a bit unlikable from the jump by basically retelling this story where she offered to pay for a dinner while on a date. And the guy took her up on that offer. And uh, then she like roasted him. I went on a date with this guy and he it was like the second day long story short he like let me pay I laughed at his face I was like I can't believe you just let me pay for that and he was like what like so confused that I like called him out because no one would do that literally like I'm embarrassed to be here right now I paid to get my hair done I paid to get my brows done I paid for like medication like birth control the least they could do is pay for dinner now yes I get it like the guy should usually try to pay but I just feel like intentionally offering and then roasting the guy feels really really strange to me but then we've got Tim and Tim is interesting because he oscillates between charming and then just a complete doofus. Initially, he seems all good, but then basically at the wedding night, at their first meal, he basically drops the bomb that like, oh yeah, in the past six months, I actually broke up with my ex of six years and I was actually planning on proposing to her. Um, your last relationship, what happened there? She was unfaithful to me. Six years, we were together for six years. That's a long time. I was gonna propose to her this year. What? Now, yes, it is good to be honest, and there is a point in time where it probably would have been good to disclose that. Probably not the time, though. On top of that, all he really had to say here to defuse this situation was basically just, oh, I'm completely over and I'm ready for something new. But instead, he says to Sarah, oh, yeah, I'm really hoping that, like, you can help with that in terms of, like, I'm hoping you can help me get over her. To which she obviously responds in horror. When did you, um, break up? It ended about six months ago. Oh. Yeah, hopefully it's not too much of a curveball for you, you know? Concern with that is just that it's like so recent. I need your help. To get what, to, what need your help to get over your ex? He then goes like, oh, um, actually, I didn't mean it like that. But it's like, what did you mean, Tim? What did you mean? On top of that, his initial reaction of going, oh, what the hell? I didn't mean it like that. Like putting it on Sarah as if he didn't actually mean it like that. Oh, no, no, <laughs> not like that. What the hell? You absolutely did mean it like that. Like, how else is she meant to take, oh yeah, you can help with that. So fucking odd. Tim's best man speech needs to be seen to be believed. Basically, the speech is this whole running joke of uh, Tim's love for experiments. And by experiments, he means previous sexual partners. So he refers to women as uh, experiments, which is already gonna set everyone offside. Basically, he goes on and goes, experiment number 69, can you get roadhead? Ha 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 ha. Experiment number 71, after getting injured during roadhead, can you have head in the ER? 
ha 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 ha. Experiment 551. Is roadhead safe? Experiment 552. Is it okay to get head in the ER since you crash your car and you're here now anyway? That was the following experiment, by the way. Experiment 426. This experiment took place several years ago. 799. 386. And he did on many occasions. But then he tells this story about how experiment number 742 is the time that he ate rancid chicken. And then he ends this speech by turning to his new wife and says, hey, experiment number 657, uh, good to know that because he ate the rancid chicken, he'll still eat you if you're rancid. Basically saying like, oh, he'll still eat you if your vagina smells. Like Jesus Christ, man. And Sarah, you can find solace in the fact, rancid or not, Tim will still eat you. But then overall, they seem to recover from that. He seems to get along pretty well with her. Then they just have a prime example of what MAPS is made for. Just a completely dysfunctional, unnecessary fight that could have been completely avoided. Sarah's having a pretty visceral and over the top reaction about some vodka, to which Tim basically goes to say, hey, relax, have a good night. Uh, he then holds his tongue and says, ah, don't worry about it. And she goes, no, nah, no, nah, say what you were gonna say. And then he says, oh, I was just gonna tell you to relax. It's not good to kill her. It's not cool yet. It's not great. You need to, um... Just say it. No, I was gonna say you need to relax. Oh yeah, you don't say that. First off, could have worded a better Tim, could have said, oh, I just was gonna say, you know, relax, enjoy the night, but he kind of says it in a bluntness, which of course was gonna set her off. But her reaction here was just completely absurd. To be fair to Tim, I think she was making a pretty big deal about the tequila and wasn't being very hospitable. They have a massive blow up about this. She makes it a women's issue saying you should never tell women to relax if you know anything about women. When you tell a woman to relax, like most of the time, 99% I didn't tell you to relax. a woman I didn't tell you to relax. would not be relaxed after that. And he basically handles this with the elegance of a bulldozer and completely fumbles. Between the two of them, you basically see a real time example of what makes maths great. It's just watching these people tear each other apart. I'm moving. So basically episode two picks up from this fight between Sarah and Tim. It's pretty hysterical. Basically he comes up to her and goes, hey, like, uh, can we just like restart and have a good time? And she basically goes like, yeah, look, you definitely set me off. And um, I just I just don't know how we can move forward from this. And it's like, you don't know how you can move forward from this. He basically just asked you to relax. Like, I think your relationship should be able to handle this. I also love the part where she goes, I mean, I'll accept partial blame for that. I think the blow up there was mostly on her. Like, yes, maybe tonality wise, could have said relax better, but like, I think it's true. I, I think if it was gender swapped and a guy was freaking out about his beer not being cold enough or something, I think the woman would have every right to be like, hey, like settle down. I, I, I love the part where she basically goes like, oh, we were both wrong and I forgive you. And basically he just like head nods and agrees. And you can tell internally seeing they're going, oh my God, who did I marry? That's what I'm trying to say. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. All right. I take like partial fault because maybe I shouldn't have acted that way. But then we're introduced to the two new couples, which is Sarah and Tim. Hello everyone, I'm really sorry. When I start a new show, I am terrible with names and I accidentally in this section called Tori and Jack, uh, Tim and Sarah. The website I was reading off mislabeled them and because I'm so bad with remembering names, it was just kind of an accident waiting to happen. So during this section, I am talking about Tori and Jack. Later on in the video, I do fix it up, but I'm really sorry about that. I tried to refilm, I just couldn't get the flow right. Now, Tim is basically a personal trainer who won't shut the fuck up about how alpha he is. He compares himself to Christian Grey. He won't shut up about his sex life. He's like, I'm the alpha. I love being dominant in bed. I'm the best. I'm Jack. I'm a personal trainer from the Gold Coast. Would I call myself an alpha? Yes. Sex to me. Yeah. Alrighty. Super important. How <laughs> you look to people think you're yeah, I'm gonna say short answer, yes. Tim's a wanker, all right? Like he's a personal trainer, but he just doesn't shut the fuck up about how alpha he is, how dominant he is in the bedroom, how awesome his sex life is. It's like, dude, shut the fuck up. Like anyone that needs to brag about it this much probably isn't doing that well. It basically just feels like he watched the 10 most popular red pill videos and went, yep, that's gonna be my whole personality. Fuck yeah, let's go. People ask me all the time, what are you gonna do if your daughter's married a guy like you? I fucking hope so. I really do. Because he'll be strong enough to allow her to let go and be inside his 
frame because she believes in him or they would work for me. It's just so cringy to watch someone actually exemplify what these red pill videos are with such shameless conviction. Like, dude, what are you doing? Basically, his whole thing is like, I'm dominant. Things need to be my way or they need to be the highway. Like, I can't deal with compromise at all. And basically, the experts sat there and went, why don't we pair him with someone who doesn't like being told what to do, doesn't like being subservient, doesn't want to be a housewife and wants her own independence. So for some reason, the experts thought that would be a great idea. So they paired him with- I'm absolutely a control freak. And I think going into this process where I actually have no control will be interesting. Self-proclaimed control freak. She also likes being dominant. She also likes things her way or the highway. You get a feeling as this couple is explored that he's gonna be the one that really upholds his whole my way or the highway thing. And she feels a bit more like she would change for the right guy. Unfortunately, Tim is not the right guy because Tim is a cockhead. The wedding goes fine. He seems pretty excited. She seems head over heels with him. And you can feel from the jump like, oh, I don't think he's as keen on her as she is on him. We then get to the wedding where we realize Jack doesn't have any like friends or family. He only has personal training clients, which feels very strange. It's also noticeable because it feels like all the girls that he's invited feels like people that Tim would want to sleep with. Basically, Sarah's friend sniffs this out and comes up to Sarah and goes, oh, something's not right here. He's only got personal training clients, yada, 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 yada. Why is everyone here a client of yours? Where are your long-term relationships? Because that's what I want to see. I want to see that you can maintain a long-term relationship. It doesn't have to be romantic. Yeah. But where is that? Now, I just want to talk about this quickly because I'm kind of split about this. Now, on one end, she does kind of feel like a bit of a jealous friend that doesn't want to give her friend up and like have a man replace her role in her life as the most important person. However, you could also say she's just looking out for a friend after years of doing that already. And the hard thing about this is I think she's right about Tim. I think Tim is fucking sus. I'm also hearing whispers and rumors about where this season goes and most likely it is Tim. Apparently, he's the villain of this season. Old Coast personal trainer Jack already predicts He's this season's villain. I'm happy with who I am. I know who I am. I can be pretty outspoken. I can be stubborn. I don't really like to take a lot of so I think the friend's right. So I really can't drag her for being a buzzkill on this wedding day. There's this really painful section where Alessandra, the sexologist basically goes, oh, if you were going to describe your sex life uh, like as ice cream flavors, how would you explain it? And he goes, oh shit, definitely not that lame vanilla shit. Uh, maybe like chocolate and sprinkles. Definitely not vanilla when it comes to the bedroom. Um, and I am a Tell me which flavor you are. So if you're not vanilla, what's the flavor of your ice cream? What's the freakiest flavor? I don't know, like chocolate with And what's sprinkles. your freakiest flavor? You tell me what your freaky flavor is. I like a mix. I would have like, yeah, chocolate. I'd put banana in there. I'd sprinkle it with sprinkles and i put it in the microwave and melt it down. I don't know. So it's like, really? Is it like chocolate and sprinkles the most wild ice cream you could think of? Like not a sundae, not a banana, like nothing. Chocolate with sprinkles is what exemplifies my crazy. He sucks is basically at the end of the episode, he says in an interview that like, oh, I know if I'm attracted to a girl from the jump. I can tell you within the first 10 minutes, whether we're gonna be a one night stand or a brief on and off hookup or whether we're gonna get married. And, and then in the same breath, he basically goes, yeah, I don't find Sarah attractive at all. And the thing is, Sarah is attractive. To me, the vibe I get from my armchair expert opinion is that he'd rather be with people that look like his gym clients rather than Sarah, someone more down to earth. I think that's pretty slimy closed-minded and lame and i can tell like within 10 seconds if i want to be physical with this girl all is well in the land of tori and jack there's no sexual sparks flying for me at the moment but there was one thing that completely melted my mind at the episode two and that is the cameo in the preview of episode three of mitch from season nine my boy mitch is back oh, I love Mitch. Now look, was Mitch a bit disappointing? Was Ella just an amazing girl that Mitch completely fumbled? Absolutely. But I love Mitch. Uh, Mitch was hilarious. So, you're proud, you're a good you're good yeah, you're dreaming, but you, you don't, don't even know me. Oh, you know, we can you know, you're proud. You don't. Mitch was funny. I thought Mitch was like overall a good person. He just didn't have his shit together or his priorities straight. Mitch is back because in episode three, we find out that one of the grooms, one of the husbands of season 11 is Mitch's brother. 
So for the first time in mass history, they've got a bloodline running. Now, important to note, episode three opens up with something super serious. Uh, John shows up to someone's house completely unannounced. I love how they shoot this, by the way. They literally shoot it as if John has just decided to go to his house without notice and just like surprised him on the door. Like who on earth at home is actually buying that this is happening that way? But basically the guy opens the door and he finds out that his groom has actually run off. Yes, side note, this was the only gay couple of this season and the other groom has done a runner. So that just goes to show that even in same-sex relationships, men can never commit properly. They tell this man that the only option they found for him has run off and they say, we will find you another one. Uh, and then so far at least, we have not heard from him again. And my suspicion is that he will actually come back with a different groom later on in the season when they bring in two new couples. I'm hoping it's him. Sorry, before we go to episode three, we were also introduced to Lucinda and Timothy. Lucinda is amazing. She's this like spiritual woman. She's got the most calming voice I think I've ever heard. I am a person that really loves life, squeezes the bejesus out of everything that I can get out of it. She's sweet. She's earthly. She's so like well emotionally controlled. She's just the best. This is a house that loves Lucinda. Just like so cool, right? She takes everything in her stride. Like I feel like you could literally tell her to go fuck herself and she'd be like, what a beautiful thing to tell me to do. Like she is so well composed. She's paired with Timothy. Now, Timothy has an absolutely tragic backstory. Basically when he was young, his mum and his brother both died, leaving just him and his dad. And recently, about six weeks ago, his dad died. So his family is like completely wiped out. He's really lonely and he makes a point of it. But I just have to say, outside of the empathy I have for him for his family situation, Timothy's a bit cringe. Timothy's a bit unlikable. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just going to say it. Yes, he has a tragic backstory, but that can't be an excuse for like antisocial behavior. There's this whole section in the wedding where, where Lucinda is doing this like wacky spiritual like cleansing of the air or something. Do I get it? Do I understand it? No. But basically straight away, he's sitting there just going, I can't get behind this. This shit is weird. This shit is so silly. And it's just like, dude, like go easy. Like be nice to your new wife. Maybe I'm being harsh, but it just gave me the ick that he was being so judgmental of his brand new wife. Especially when Lucinda is so accepting. You know, Timothy this whole time has been like, I don't think people think I'm really attractive. I think people want to turn away when they see me. And Lucinda sees him and goes, oh my God, he's hot. I love how he looks. I love him. Oh my God. Oh my God. But then Timothy, after this whole sob story of being like, oh, women probably turn away from me. No one wants to love poor old Timothy. When he finds a woman that does actually love him, starts shit talking her spiritual practices. I really didn't like it. On top of that, his whole like tin man shtick, I really don't like. I think it's really like icky and very like, I'm such a nice guy. It's like, like, I, I don't like it. This label that you've attracted, the Tin Man. Can you talk me through that so that I can be really clear on what you mean? A friend of mine said, oh, you're like the Tin Man. You tell everyone you don't have a heart. I don't really let too many people in. Closing myself off, it's the way I protect myself. Basically, he keeps going on this motif of like, I'm just the ugly guy that no one wants to date. I'm just the sad little tin man. And it's like, dude, stop, cut it out. Because he's got this amazing woman, Lucinda. And not only does he rag on the spiritual stuff, like I mentioned, but he also then says that he's not sexually attracted to her after complaining that people don't find him sexually attractive. Just totally off. Moving back to episode three, we have Eden and Jaden. Now, Jaden is Mitch's brother. One of my favorite parts of this episode is where Mitch in the episode basically goes, oh, my brother's so much better than me. He's way better. He doesn't have the commitment issues I have. He's going to do it way better than I did when I was on this show. Basically gassing his brother up. And then his brother basically gets on camera and goes, uh, yeah, Mitch was a bit of a dickhead. Uh, he has commitment issues. Uh, he's immature. He can be argumentative. It's so funny to me. Like he just completely starts roasting his brother. A lot of people assume that because we're brothers, that I'm the same. They think that I have trust issues like him. All this, all this, cameras in my face is not what I like. They think that I'm a little bit of a smart ass like him. Oh, you're not wigging, are you? Oh, you're not wigging, are you, right? They think that I have commitment issues like him. I'm sorry, Ella, but right now I just can't give you the commitment I know that you want. After his brother was gassing him up. Jaden's matched with Eden and so far they look like one of the best couples. Jaden has a really great aura and vibe to him. He just seems like a gentleman without being a pushover or without losing sight of his masculinity. I really like his vibe. I can't really explain it better than that. He genuinely seems like a sweetie. He seems like a better version of Tim. He's got the same caliber physique. He's got the same level of good looks, but he's just like a sweet guy and a genuine guy. Whereas Tim, just massive ick. Right, so obviously this video Video takes a while to edit so I've seen a few more episodes since then and uh, I have just had the big reveal with Jaden um, oh my fucking god uh, take back everything I said about him being a sweet dude uh, we'll get to that in the next video when I do it but oh my god next couple we have are Natalie and Collins this one was a hard watch this one was so disappointing 
When I first saw them paired up, I went, yep, even a broken clock shows the right time twice a day. And I went, Maths has finally been able to pair two compatible people together. However, very quickly it took a turn. So basically Collins is like a guy that's never had a girlfriend. He's clearly a bit intimidated by women and sex, but he seems like a really sweet and genuine guy. Then we've got Natalie, who's a really like down to earth, nerdy girl who's had a serious long-term relationship before. At first they seem like a perfect match on the wedding night. They both like Taylor Swift. They both like Essendon. Then they get to the dinner and basically her energy levels are like through the roof and his are like pretty high also, but hers are just like up here, right? Basically we watch in real time as Collins gets the ick. Now I do want to play devil's advocate for just a second here. There are a few comments on the wedding night from Natalie that I thought were a bit strange. The one about how basically she was rubbing shoulders with famous people and they'll soon be wanting to fawn after her was a bit strange. Got to rub shoulders with all these famous people. I'm like, just wait a year and then you'll all be fawning over me. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one at the expense of Collins is like lack of relationship history. Basically saying like, oh, I'll teach you how to be in a relationship with me. Don't you even worry, I'll set you straight. It was a bit condescending and weird. So we're committed. Mister, I've never been in a relationship before. There you go, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well played, well played. Oh, no, no. I'll, I can teach you a few things. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. However, this one's actually really hard for me to unpack because basically, yes, her energy is really high, but I can't help but feel like Collins is shitty on her a bit. I just don't see this relationship being successful at all. I think he's going to completely dull her sparkle, completely shit on her excitement. And while there are valid things he could bring up and raise, I don't think he has the ability to communicate those well, as shown by his painful, painful interviews. But as we kept going more and more and more into conversation, there was just so much energy. He's just a complete doofus. He forgets her name. When he's asked about whether they're gonna share a bed together, he gets so uncomfortable that he basically acts like he doesn't understand the question. And then basically Collins.exe just stops working for a second. First night with your wife, are you gonna share the bed? Am I allowed to ask, are we having one bed? Are we like, are we, where are we going? Are we going to a... I hate this. I hate this. He knows exactly what the producer is asking and he's just like, oh, what do you, whatever could you mean? Do you mean something sexual or do you just mean the location of the bed? Do you know the plans? Like, dude, stop. If this is how he's going to engage with his wife or partner, like, I can't see any more of it. I hate it. I don't know the logistics. But okay. Do you want to share um, bed with uh, your wife tonight? Look, we all get caught up in the moment, human beings. I just got married. What a day. What a day. That was one of the most painful moments on reality TV I've ever seen. Like as an audience member with my girlfriend just seeing that, I was like, how do we even like, uh, what are we doing? This is cringier than the curse. <laughs> Just a hard watch, honestly. Like, just someone who's chosen to be on TV, like genuinely like actually having like a technical malfunction in front of us. It genuinely felt like someone had to come up behind Collins and like reset his hard drive a bit. Reset their hard drive. It was really strange. So yeah, look, Natalie made some insensitive comments. Natalie's energy was a bit high, but Collins is such a fucking buzzkill. Like dude, just have fun for a bit, get through the honeymoon and then down the line, basically just say, hey, like I find it really hard to keep up with this energy, but I don't want you to take it personally. What can we do about this? Leave it up to her, but like Collins Collins just can't communicate like that. I just feel like he's gonna tank what could be a really good relationship. All right, so on to episode four. The first couple we are introduced to are Ali and Ben. And I'm gonna be real, Ali and Ben are a bit boring. Ali seems really sweet. She has a really tragic backstory about the previous guy she was with lasted eight years. And then one day he just kind of got home and went, I'm not in love with you anymore. And then got with someone else and got her pregnant very shortly after. So very sad. Ben is a travel guide whose friend died recently. But honestly, just in terms of what we come to the show for, unhinged drama, uh, these people are gonna be pretty tame it seems so far. Very reserved, very mild manners. They almost need more spice, you know? And what they lack in spice as a couple, Ali's weird cousin more than makes up for. Basically, this guy comes onto the scene, comes to the wedding, comes to the after party. It's just sitting there the whole time being like, something's wrong with this guy and I'm gonna find it. I'm, I'm gonna figure out what's wrong with this guy. And so far, Benny's just so boring. I really don't think he has too much wrong with him, but this guy's like, nah, we're, we're gonna figure it out. We're gonna get to the bottom of it. My impression of Ben so far is yes, he's a bit bland, but he seems totally fine. I just find so funny that this sassy cousin is like, no, we're gonna figure this out. Just such an amazing moment when he goes up to Ben, like a school teacher going up to a kid and goes, 
Can you come with me, please? Walks him out of his own wedding and then checking over his shoulder to see that he's still coming. And then they have this really cringy, awkward confrontation where he goes, are you here to promote your podcast? And there is so much humor to be had in the fact that this guy is roasting him about whether he's here just to promote his podcast. Earlier in the night, he went, oh, tell me about this podcast. Do many people listen to it? Like, tell me, tell me, tell me. Basically forcing Ben to sit there with his tail in between his legs and be like, no, my podcast is shit and no one listens to it. It's just a fun hobby so far. I do some tour guiding and doing like podcasts. It's like a hobby. Oh, you have a, oh, you have a podcast. How many subscribers do you have? <laughs> not, not much. Not much. <laughs> okay. Hey, can I just ask you though, Ben? Why are you here? But the weird thing is, Ben completely fumbles this interaction. All this cousin is trying to do is make sure that Ben is here for the right reasons, isn't here for fame, and actually wants to be with Ali. And instead of just responding to these questions like a normal human being, he basically gives the most sus answers possible. For example, Ali's cousin literally goes, oh, so you're sure you're not here to promote the podcast? And the guy literally goes, oh, I mean, if the podcast gets promoted, that's a pr that's a silver lining. Dude, like, I know what you were going for, but totally wrong expression. I I got my ink with you. I have concerns that you might be here to promote your touring business, promote your podcast. You're just here for fame. And I just feel like hearing those sorts of things from you tonight. That's one sort of silver lining. You know, but if love happens out of it, great. What he should have said is, I'm here for love, but if there happen to be some benefits, like I'm not gonna complain. But instead he basically made it sound like, oh yeah, this is an awful experience, but the silver lining would be the podcast fame. Just totally weird response and gives no reassurance to the cousin, which I feel like most people could have figured out and handled better than he did. Aside from that bland new couple, we also get to check in on the old couples and that's where the meat of this show is. That's where the great drama is. Uh, so we cut to Tori and Jack and they are met with one of Math's most diabolical inventions ever, the honesty box. Now for the uninitiated, the honesty box is basically a display box from Target filled with the most diabolical questions you could ever make two people ask each other. And not only that, but they are almost always incredibly specific and clearly pointed and loaded. If, so if someone says in an interview, oh, I've always struggled with having a wandering eye, the first question that the honesty box will ask them is, have you ever cheated on your partner? A another example is in one season, there was a white groom and an Asian wife, and he didn't feel very physically attracted to her. So the first question they gave him was, are you not attracted to her due to the fact that she's Asian? The honesty box is evil, it's diabolical, and it's one of the best things in maths. So as we already discussed in my previous chunk of this video, Jack doesn't find Tori that hot, but basically he gets given the question, are you sexually attracted to Tori? Which he says no, and she just like cops it. And then he keeps talking, he doesn't even just leave it. And he eventually gets to a point where he says, oh, well, actually I didn't even really want to sleep with you. Like, dude, what are you doing? Do not say that, just stop. All these people in this show just say so much more than they need to all the time. But I mean, like, who am I to talk, right? Do you feel any sexual chemistry with me? In my head, the day I met you, I wasn't like going, God damn, I want to get this girl in bed. So it's not the first thing on my mind. I didn't even want to sleep with you the first night, second night, it was not on my mind. The cringe this episode gets worse because fucking Tin Man starts rejecting Lucinda. Throughout this episode, he basically turns down all her sexual advances and she's literally turned to the camera being like, he's so sexy, I just want him to ravage me, oh my God. And he's seen there like, oh, I, I just don't feel it yet. Oh, it's, it's, it's because I don't see myself as attractive. I'm just so, I'm just the Tin Man. And it's like, dude, I actually think you're a bit shallow. Like, I think you're lying. He doesn't find it hot because he just wants some like young influencer looking chick. I think he's sitting there and playing the face nice guy card being like, it's all about me and my own insecurity. I'm not buying it for a second. Do you feel any sexual chemistry with me? It's not there. I genuinely feel like shit. Because I know what it's like. Rejection to the face just sucks. And on top of that, then they meet their fiercest opponent yet, the honesty box, where he basically has to actually relay this to her and say, yeah, I'm just not feeling it yet. Uh. And if it wasn't cringy enough, then we have to catch up with Collins and his nerdy girlfriend. And oh my God, 
Oh my God. She's got the ick so hard from Collins that she's put up a pillow fall. By the way, I do think he's a bit of a like shit test challenge. I think she secretly wants him to like break down the pillow fort and be like, let's cuddle, right? Like, I think it's almost a bid to be like, come on, like, let's challenge. I want you to like break this. But look, regardless, as I said previously, he's just shitting on her at this point. Like she jumps on the bed to be like, oh my God, we're at the hotel. Like, let's jump on the bed. Not only does he not jump on the bed, but instead of giving an excuse, like, oh, I'm a bit tired. He literally goes, oh, we don't need to jump on the bed. We see beds all the time. Like what? A fucking buzzkill. Where did they find this guy? I, I, I can't stand him. And he gets worse. Next, episode five, we are introduced to Andrew and Richard. This is the old couple of the season. There's always one. Typically, they get along really well. There's way less drama. However, this one seems a bit spicy. Not too much to note here. A bit boring. Richard is actually the oldest contestant they've ever had ever. And John actually made a special mention to be like, well, we're going to pair him with someone age appropriate and not a 30 year old because that'd be really problematic. Look, so far, Richard is a bit cringe. He just keeps going like, oh, I'm 62, but I don't think I look it and me and my girlfriend went no you look 62. I really like Andrea his wife though. Andrea is like a really sweet soul. I would hang out with her she seems really cool but I feel like Richard and Andrea are going to be a bit mismatched and we're going to see that play out as the season goes. The more interesting couple of this season is Lauren and Jonathan. So basically Jonathan is a really well-kempt guy a really in shape really sweet really like him to be honest really like good vibes from him. I, I really like him. The only red flag he has is basically when he says yeah I kind of have a one that got away and all my friends make jokes about it they keep going like oh you need to find your version of cynthia or whatever the fuck her name was jesus died for our cynthia's aside from that weird red flag that he brings up he seems really sweet uh again like a really impressive guy lauren on the other hand is like really interesting because i love her vibe i love how funny she is and from what i've seen this season she actually seems really really good for some reason it might just be nerves she does some really weird shit on this honeymoon basically lauren's vibe is the vibe of jennifer lawrence between the hunger games and red sparrow just that like uber relatable like oh my god like i can't go two days without pizza ha 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 she is basically that but for KFC. She's very down to earth. She's very relatable. She's quite loose. I don't know if the producers are hamming this up. I've seen speculation on Reddit that they're actually like photoshopping a drink to make it look like alcohol instead of water. So maybe they're playing up this sort of like alcoholic angle I've heard. However, to be honest, she just seems like a girl that knows how to have fun. She she knows how to throw it back. And the most surprising thing ever is that even though Jonathan is like really clean and uptight, he actually seems to really like Lauren's looser vibe. It seems like they actually like balance each other out. Really fascinating to watch. However, on the honeymoon, things take a Turn. Again, they get along like a house on fire, but then the next day she basically wakes up and goes like, oh, you know that ick you get after a one night stand? Like I've basically got that. Like I woke up, I sobered up and I went, I don't really like this guy. He's a bit too nice. And my issue here is this validates all those like stupid nice guys insecurities where they go like, the reason girls reject me is because I'm too nice. Look at the TV, look at maths. So for some reason she just wakes up and she's like, yeah, I don't like this. You're not mean enough. This is, this is boring. I just feel like... I don't know. You're too nice. Are you kidding? No. Well, I think I was nice for like five minutes and now you've just made a decision in your mind as to who I am in like four hours of weirdness of meeting us when we're in this like upside down world. But mad cred to Jonathan, the way he conducts himself here, he's just like, this is this is ridiculous. You're gonna get your heart broken. Like you've got a really good guy here and you haven't even given me a chance to be fun. Like this is absurd. He basically diffuses it on the spot. And then by the end of the night, they're having a great time. He basically like saved the relationship in like 10 minutes. If I gave you what you wanted, you'd then be like, guys are assholes. I feel like you need to learn this. I feel like you are still stuck in the, I want an asshole. And then yeah, you'll go through the right. same thing and be hurt. Mad credit to Jonathan. And now they go to dinner parties and they have an amazing time together. So sick to see. Also, I know I said the oldies were a bit old, but uh, they're the only couple aside from Jack and Tori, which Jack regrets, that have slept together. So uh, mad props to the oldies. The one other thing I want to mention is Jono's stepsister. What the fuck is going on with her? So basically Jono's stepsister is at the wedding and she just seems a little too jealous of Lauren. Like, yes, she's obviously judgy. She's got a silver spoon in her mouth and she's like, Lauren's too loud. She's making sex jokes, she's drinking, she's disgusting, but Jono's having a really good time and that's who it matters to, right? But she's sitting there literally like, like hoping the camera falls on her, just like, 
<laughs> Why be so unlikable? Like, I don't know who she thinks she's looking out for. And the fact that she's so concerned about her stepbrother's love life, it's like, are you jealous? Like, what is going on? It just feels like that weird thing that mums do with their sons, where they're like, no woman is good enough for my son, stay away. But it's his stepsister. And it's such a strong vibe that I literally thought it was his mother for a lot of the episode because I missed the stepsister introduction. Oh my God, I'm going to blow your mind. Oh, oh dear. Let's, he knows what he's here for. And if it's not right, he'll walk away. Then we have what maths is made for the dinner party. Basically what dinner parties are for maths are what WWE like Royal Rumbles are, all right? Basically it's just couples tearing each other apart, picking out insecurities, picking out insecurities in each other, in each other's partners, just completely throwing like verbal nuclear bombs at each other. Unbelievable television, unbelievable television. People throw hands, people throw glasses, people throw wine, it's incredible. And this one does not disappoint, but we'll get to that because the episode opens with more Colin's cringe. He does it again. They basically go like, oh, do you see a future with your wife? And he does the same thing that he did last time about sleeping together and starts gaslighting the producer and playing dumb. When we know he's not dumb, he keeps doing it. And if this is how he conducts himself in relationships, I'm gonna vomit. He just starts sitting there going, by future, like whatever could you mean? Like, do you mean tomorrow? It's not that person that you're looking for or not. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm kind of, again, my vocab is. What'd you say? It was. My vocab is. What'd you say? It was. Mate, you're an he did that before. He did that before. He did that in the last episode yourself. when I asked him a question. He's, he's trying to gaslight the producer. Oh, I think he's trying to gaslight Sorry, us. You can't see yourself in a future with Nat? No, not at all. <laughs> wait, I can't. Wait, what? No, not at all. As in, I can't see a future. I don't know. What does that question mean? No. Can you see a future with Nat at this moment in time? Oh my God. Sorry, I didn't know what you meant. <laughs> He asked, do I see a future with that? I have mistranslated in my head. I don't like this guy. Bob, he he's an EA. Makes calls, does emails. Make that phone call for me. Um, Sorry, did you mean you call mean, on the phone? I thought you meant like, call out. To say no, not at all. It's far too early for me to not. Um, that chicken. Yeah. That was a chicken. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> you do, sure. Do you see a future with her? I don't... What was the question? I just... I, I don't know. Like, do I see her in the future as in, like, tomorrow? Or do you mean... Like, I don't actually... Or... Like, bro, like how does he executive assist? You know? No, that's what I'm saying. Do you mean in a few hours? Ha 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 It's like, shut up, Collins. You know exactly what they mean. And you're just playing dumb. It's revolting. I, I, I can't stand him. I can't stand it. But the thing is, his nerdy wife isn't perfect either. And basically they both just feel like children and it's so, so difficult to watch. They basically have a fallout because he organizes a fishing trip, which yes, isn't the most like romantic thing on a honeymoon to do. However, it is an idea, it is an activity. She basically goes like, oh, I'm not really feeling fishing. And he goes, I sense the vibe that you're not keen on the fishing idea. So he sniffs out a bit of a vibe, but then instead of going, what would you like to do? Or can you help me? I've never been in a relationship before. Like picking a normal romantic idea. He follows it up with another non-romantic boyish idea. Drive you a four by four through the desert. Like, what are you doing, bro? Just, just take her to the beach with a bottle of wine and a cheese board. Like, come on. Uh, next, we have this massive Jack reveal. Apparently Jack had a girlfriend literally until the moment he went on to maths. So he had a girlfriend and then without telling her he was going on maths, he applied for maths and then just went, um, bye and has appeared on TV. So obviously this spits in the face of what the social experiment is all about. So so the judges are pissed and the contestants are pissed and he's in trouble. And in typical maths fashion, the dramas come out right before they go to the dinner party. So then everyone in the car and the dinner party is going, did you hear about the controversy? Did you hear about the scandal? Oh, well, it's definitely gonna get heated at the dinner party. It's almost as if the producers have this news and information and share it at the right exact moment. And if we're gonna talk about right exact moments, it is always the most controversial, the most problematic, the center of attention for that night that shows up last to the dinner party. So then everyone else 
gets there early and gets their gossip and bitching in. You know, sharpen the knife, sharpen the tools. I just love picturing the private driver that's taking the controversial couple for that week to the dinner party, just doing laps around the block being like, uh, yeah guys, they're not finished shit talking you. So we're gonna do another round. Does anyone need a drink or anything? Do you wanna stop by Macca's actually? I'm getting peckish. There are two pivotal things that happen at the dinner party. And funnily enough, the biggest thing isn't actually Jack and Tori. Basically everyone sits down, everyone wants to talk about the Jack and Tori controversy. And then Jaden, God bless his soul, basically just goes, uh, you know what? I feel like everyone wants to talk about it. I feel like everyone's avoiding it. I'm just gonna say it. He, he throws gasoline on the fire and just goes, what on earth is going on? Tell us about it. It was a very like casual, but yet exclusive relationship but very casual. Um. Uh, Jack basically gaslights the whole table. No one's buying it except Tori. And you can tell Tori's even a bit like, Neh. he sells us some bullshit. No one's buying it. The biggest lie he makes is when he goes, look, there's some truth to it. But basically she's just a disgruntled ex. And like, the thing is like, we broke up like six weeks before the experiment. And I hadn't even been thinking about the experiment at that point. And then the experts note that the application process and how long it actually takes is way longer than six weeks. So he would have been with someone and applied to maths like he is actually bullshitting like factually speaking so eight weeks ago i tried to end tried to end it wait a minute if he tried to end it seven weeks ago he was well into the experiment looking into the experiment process here yeah, we're gonna need to talk to him about that I just have to give a lot of credit to Lauren here. She's very perceptive. She calls out a bunch of stuff that's really valid and it's really interesting. It was like, let me make my ex look as crazy as possible so that whatever comes to light, I've discredited her first. So whatever comes to light, I've essentially created like this guard around myself. So like she's crazy and I'm right. I think we're getting insight into what's gonna be a season long beef where basically she sees Jack for who he actually is and is picking up on a lot of his little microaggressions and what he's doing. And he really, really wants to discredit her as like an alcoholic loudmouth idiot. I think that's gonna be a plot point that plays out throughout this season where basically she sees him and he basically invalidates her and goes, what, are you gonna trust the alcoholic loudmouth? In the previews, we've seen a clip of someone saying, yo, muzzle your woman. I think it's gonna be Jack to John about Lauren. So that'll be really interesting to see. But yeah, Lauren and John are like a really good team, weird enough. He's obviously a lot more quiet, but she'll start throwing shade and asking questions and he'll back her up where he needs to and just like sit there and like go along with it. I like Jono, I like Lauren and I love them together. But next, the worst moment of the episode, the worst moment of the season so far is Collins and Natalie. Basically, Natalie, the nerdy girl has been realizing all episode that like Collins just doesn't get it. He just doesn't get it. You know, he's a bit, and, and she's getting to her wits end. Now, yes, I'm not impressed with her lack of communication skills. She starts getting upset. She starts crying in private. She doesn't really let him in and open up to him at all. However, Collins surely can tell. Like she's so clearly visibly upset. You know, maybe it's worth Collins saying to her like, hey, like I'm not a mind reader. Can we please just talk like adults? However, we see how much effort he puts into impressing literally everyone around him. I think he's here to make friends. I think he's gross. We wanted this to work. It's not fair. <laughs> Very first in a party. And yeah. Right, and you know this because eventually Natalie actually starts having serious problems and goes, we might need to leave the experiment. And his reaction is, oh, like I've got work tomorrow. Like I put stuff off for this and like everyone's having a good time and I just want to go hang out with everyone. And like, this has happened. Ugh. Yeah. So clearly he's just here to have a good time. And I guess a girlfriend is a sweet bonus. But on top of that, that disingenuous nature that I've been highlighting really comes out here. Cause basically Natalie goes, actually, you know what? I'm throwing in the towel. I'm done with this. I can't do it. Like I know this isn't working, we're leaving. And then he gives me maybe the worst performance of acting concerned I think I've ever seen. So obviously Collins doesn't really like Natalie that much, all right? That's what's becoming clear. He clearly isn't that sexually or romantically interested in her. Instead of just going like, oh, this stuff happens and unfortunately we're not that compatible. He does this like awful, I don't even know what to call it. It's like this awful performance of like, oh, wow. I guess that's it everyone. Like, oh, like I'm I'm just as shocked as you are. I feel like, <laughs> and I just wanna say before you guys come up, um, it's, it's tough, it's really, really tough, but um, <clears throat> look, we're all here for love, right? Um, yeah. Collins, mate, shut up. Like, I don't get that. Was he acting? Like, it was like, he was like he was going for an Academy Award. That's goodbye for me too. Oh, Whoa. Wow. 
if you were acting, you think you'd go, oh, I'm so sad. I don't want this to be over so soon. Please, wife, don't leave me. But he like doesn't say any of the normal stuff. And I love that Jaden is basically like, yeah, this is a massive bullshit performance. Collins and Natalie agree to leave the experiment after barely giving it a go. I just wanted to come and say goodbye. <laughs> I've taken up, I feel like. <laughs> anyway, so that's the first week of maths done. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know any constructive feedback of what you want for the future maths episodes. Let me know if you want me to keep doing them. Thank you so, so much for watching. Please subscribe and please let me know what else you'd like me to talk about. Thank you so, so much.